Hello to everybody and welcome to the today's lecture, public lecture within the Strong 2020 European program. And before going, however, to our lecture, which is extremely interesting one and very peculiar one, I'd like to read a declaration and on however, behalf to our lecture, of which our is extremely interesting sorry. one and very peculiar one. I'd like to read a declaration. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to read a declaration on behalf of our Strong 2020 community. So the Strong 2020 community representing a deeply rooted European project, it's living as all European citizens with anxiety and concern these dramatic hours. Our thoughts are in these moments going to our Ukrainian colleagues and Ukrainian population. The Strong 2020 community continues to champion and promote the scientific collaboration across the world. With this, let me uh, welcome the speakers of today and all of you who are now uh, listening to our lecture, which, as I told you, it's a very peculiar one because it shows how the physics we are doing, in particular the hadron hadronic physics, which is the main ingredient of our strong 2020 European project. It's helping to treat tumors, both for what concerns the physics, which is involved interaction of hadron physics, hadron particles with the biological matter, and also for what concerns the development of particular uh, peculiar particle accelerators, which are accelerating in this case protons, or ions. So we will show you how this uh, peculiar technology, hadron therapy, works. We will tell you what it is and exactly how it works. And that's the reason for which our lecture is entitled Hadron Therapy, what it is and how it works. And we have two exceptional speakers for this lecture. Uh, they are coming from Germany. And uh, the first speaker is Wolfgang Engart from the Technische University of Dresden, who will be followed by uh, Barbara Vischioni from Pavia, working directly with patient uh, for the treatment of cancer with this peculiar method. Before, however, introducing our speakers of today, let me tell you some words about our European project. Strong 2020, uh, its longer name is the Strong Interaction at the Frontier of knowledge, it's performing fundamental research, and it's also concerned with applications like the one we are presenting you today, Hadron Therapy, and has received funding from European Union within the Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation. And it's involving a huge number of scientists, uh, actually, and also institutions, 44 participating institutions from 14 European member states. It also has one European international organization like CERN and other European candidate countries. It's uh, organized and structured in research working package and these are involving uh, development of new technology, research itself, and also offers transnational access to laboratories in uh, Europe. These laboratories are uh, belonging to six class world experimental facilities, COSI, MAMI, Frascati, LNF, ELSA, GSI, FAIR, and CERN. And in addition to this, there is a seventh one, which is a European Center for Theoretical Physics, ACT STAR, in Trento. Uh, our community is uh, forging the uh, future of this type of research. There are more than 3,000 persons and researchers involved in this research. And the lecture of today, it's a double lecture, as I already told you. Our first speaker, whom I invite to join me here, it's Dr. Wolfgang Engart, who is a physicist and a professor of medical radiation physics, uh, belonging to the National Center for Radiation Research in Oncology and the University Hospital and Medical Faculty in the Technische Universität in Dresden. So I welcome Professor Engart with, with us. He will tell us about 
how the physics uh, helps to forge this uh, treatment for for the near for the near future and i uh, invite professor engard to uh, share with us this uh, particle therapy physics basics for um, for the next minutes please and thank you very much professor engard to be here with us today Please, uh, before before leaving the floor to you, I um, want to tell to the people who are listening to us if they have questions to write their questions in chat, and we shall take care to um, ask your questions to our speakers of today. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, noon, everybody from Germany, and I will start now my presentation. Can you see it full screen? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see my presentation too? We can hear you very well and we see you very well. Your presentation. Oh, is so I can start. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a uh, the following outline of my presentation, I will say something about the objectives of this talk and then I will go into the physics. I will speak about stopping power and range, about lateral scattering of uh, uh, therapeutic beams and of nuclear interactions. Here I have uh, some pictures on some transparencies. These are mostly pictures from the University Proton Therapy in Dresden. Uh, let me start with the objectives. Uh, I hope at the end of my talk, you understand something about the stopping process of charged particles that are used for therapy. I hope you will understand uh, the fundamentals of the scattering process of charged particles and how they influence the dose distributions. You should understand something about the degradation of therapeutic particle beams by nuclear interactions. And I give you some information on the role of the electronic and nuclear interactions for practical therapy. Yeah, let's start. Uh, about stopping power and range of particle beams. Uh, the most prominent property of the uh, particle beams is its inverted dose depth distribution, meaning at the surface, at the entrance, the dose is pretty low and it increases towards the range of the particles in tissue. This is in contradiction to the usual dose distribution of photons, which show a maximum in a few centimeters in depth and then an exponential degree decrease. Uh, I have already mentioned this maximum. This is the famous Bragg peak. And you can see from this measurement we did in Dresden that the range of the particles is scaling with the energy of the beam. Here you have the energy in MeV. And here you see the depth dose curves of protons in water. Yeah, and if we superimpose in the right intensity a few of such uh, depth dose curves, we can reach the so called spread out Bragg peak that we need to treat extended tumors in the depth of the body. Now, I would like to explain you uh, how this can happen. And this is a transparency, not so much for the physicists. It is more a mechanistical model of the stopping process. If we consider the mass of the electron and the proton, it's here, then we have a ratio of about 2,000. And if we compare that with the mass of a soccer ball and the Formula One core, then these two items have 
the same mass ratio as the protons and the electrons. And now we have our mechanistic model. Suppose a huge pile of soccer balls and suppose the Formula One car driving into this huge pile of soccer balls and you see what happens when an ion travels through matter. Namely, the soccer balls are kicked in all directions, meaning if an ion is stopped in the matter, it interacts via the Coulomb interaction with the electrons of the matter and the electrons overtake the energy, the kinetic energy of the ion. Therefore, we have multiple collisions with the electrons and it is clear uh, if enough soccer balls are in that pile, the core is completely stopped. And the range of the core is dependent on the starting velocity of the core before running into the pile of soccer balls. Now we come a little more to physics. This is the well-known Peter Bloch equation for the electronic stopping process, and it was uh, first published in 1930, and the first considerations about that process uh, were done by Niels Bohr in the year 1913. That means the theory is nearly 100 years old. Uh, it's a pretty long formula. This is the energy loss over the traveled way. And I will not explain all this stuff here in this formula, but I will show on the next transparencies the main items and the main rules uh, uh, hidden in this formula. First, we start with the target dependency of the stopping power. Then we, uh, this is dependent on the electron density. The electron density is given by the, uh, by the uh, numbers in this red circle. This is the mass density, this is the Avogadro number, and this is the, the, the uh, atomic number and the mass number of the target material. Furthermore, we have the mean excitation energy of the atoms of the target material. And at third, we have the maximum energy transfer in a single collision. It's clear that must be a central collision. And this is written here, but at therapeutic energies, these two terms cancel out because the huge mass difference between the mass of the incoming ion and the electron. So that, in fact, this item is not longer dependent on the target material, but in the correct theory, it is so. Next, the projectile dependency. The stopping power depends on the one hand on one over beta squared. That means on the square of the velocity of the ions. And then we have some weak dependencies on the velocity of the incoming ions here in this uh, logarithmic term and in that term. And furthermore, it depends on the square of the effective projectile atomic number. Usually at higher energies, this, uh, the, the, the ions coming in are naked ions. But when the velocity is slowing down, we have to take into account this so-called Parker's correction uh, because of recharging effects, the uh, effective uh, charge of the ions will decrease. I have calculated this for protons, for instance, at 14.4 MeV, 
there is only an effective charge of 0.5. And if we look at carbon, we have an effective charge of 3 at also an energy of about 15 MeV. This is pretty low, and there are only a few millimeters uh, rest range for that product. At higher energies, this the protons will have the effective charge of one, and the carbons will have the effective charge of six. Yeah, I will uh, summarize that and have a little look on the radiobiological consequences of this stopping power. You should keep in mind that the ionization density is proportional to the stopping power. And here I have calculated the stopping power curves, namely the stopping power independence on the energy per nucleon for protons, helium beams, carbon, oxygen, and near. And additionally, I have put in this, uh, in this graph the stopping power curve for electrons. And now the consequences. Uh, the ionization density is much higher for ions than for electrons or for photons, which cause also moved electrons. You see it here. These are several orders of magnitude. Furthermore, the ionization density increases with increasing atomic number. This has to do with the Z squared. And third, the ionization density increases with decreasing kinetic energy. That means we have a higher relative biological effectiveness in the break peak compared to the entrance channel. Okay. Uh, I would like to show you on that movie how the break peak is firmed. Suppose we, uh, we have a look on carbon ions and we look at a beam of 300 MeV per nucleon. This is this frag curve. We start this 300 MeV per nucleon here at the entrance of the target and then we have a stopping power of 11 MeV per nucleon per centimeter. And then we have put 100 MeV, that means one third of the energy of the incoming carbon ion to the target. And you see, we are still about half of the range in the target. One third of the energy and half of the range we have reached. The stopping power has a little increased. Then we lose another 100 MeV per nucleon and uh, that means we have two thirds of the energy lost, but the range is more than 80% of the total range. The stopping power has nearly doubled now. And then we lose another 60 MeV per nucleon. The stopping power has again more than doubled, and we have this steep increase towards the break peak. And now, on the last few millimeters, the whole curve is moved through that point, and you see it here, we have formed the break peak. That means this high stopping power, or this, this curve with a high, high, high part of the stopping power, is moved through on the last two or three millimeters of the range of the particles. Uh, up to now, we have only considered the stopping caused by the electrons of the material. It is clear that there is also a Coulomb interaction between the target nuclei and the incoming uh, nucleus, and they also have collisions, but you see it here. 
the amount of stopping power caused by the nuclei, namely the nuclear stopping power, is much, much less than the electronic stopping power so that for therapeutic purposes, we have not to take care about the nuclear stopping power. And it is only relevant on the lowest micrometers of the uh, ion trajectory. Yeah, this all converts into the range of the particles in matter. I have here some curves on uh, the proton range. These are th these three curves in water. That is a black curve. Here is the density in gram per cubic centimeters. Then we have a lucite PMMA. This is a little higher in density, and you see at a given energy of the beam, the range is lower. And then we have graphite even with higher density, and the range is again lower. This is reflected by this relation, the so-called brecht kleeman equation, uh, where the range is indirectly proportional to the mass density of the material. But there plays also a role the uh, mass of the material, and this will I will show on my next transparency. If we compare now that between protons and heavier ions, we have a scaling rule on the masses and the charges of these different ions. And if we apply this, we see that uh, the range of uh, protons with 200 MeV uh, from that, we can calculate the range of carbon ions by the scaling law, and we see that at the same velocity, meaning at 200 MeV per nucleon, we have one third of the range of the products, meaning we need for accelerating particle beams for therapy. Uh, for, for ions heavier than protons, we need more powerful and larger accelerators. As you can see, if you look, for instance, to Knau in Pavia and compare that with a cyclotron, for instance, in Dresden. Okay. Now I come to the interesting think that the stopping power is dependent on the target mass and atomic number. And this has a serious practical consequence. Uh, in, in proton therapy, for instance, with passive, uh, be, uh, passively formed therapy beams, we use such brass collimators to laterally form the irradiation field. You see here a irregular field uh, for a patient. And these brass collimators are put into the nozzle of the proton uh, facility. And we have in house uh, a special milling machine for producing such uh, brass collimators uh, according to the results of the treatment planning system. Let us have a look to the composition of brass. This is mostly copper and zinc and a little lead. And the density is given here. And this is the, the mean atomic number. And uh, according to a formula given by Moskvin and co-workers, we can calculate the water equivalent thickness of this material. And we come out that a 3.2 centimeter thick brass aperture has a water equivalent thickness of 17.7 gram per square centimeter. And the area density is 27 gram per square centimeter. That means we 
consider in Dresden such a 3.2 centimeters brass aperture to have, for safety re reasons, a water equivalent thickness of 15.5 gram per square centimeter. And if we have to irradiate deeper seated tumors, we have to use two of such brass collimators stacked together in the nozzle. The reason you for that you see again here in this in this uh, 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 shortened uh, beta block equation. This is on the one hand this set over a behavior. It becomes smaller than 0.5 for heavier nuclei. But this is not the main reason. The main reason is this ionization potential that is around uh, 10 or 20 for water, and it is around 800 for lead. And this makes this that in heavier material, the stopping power is less than in light material, given at the same area density the material. This is pretty important for practical therapy. Let me come to the second I uh, the, the next item, namely the range struggling. Uh, the electronic stopping process is a stochastic process. That means a group of iron with a starting energy, a sharp energy E0, will have an energy distribution after the penetration of a a certain slab of material with a thickness D. In thick targets, as we have in therapy, this broadening can be considered to be Gaussian. The criterion is that the energy loss is 10 times the maximum energy loss in a single collision. And uh, you see, if we would not consider the range struggling. The Bragg maximum would be much narrower than if you consider range struggling. And on my next transparency, you can see some numerical practical values again for protons, helium, carbon, oxygen, near. And you see, uh, if you have a, a range of 10 centimeters in water, the range cycling for protons is about one millimeter. This is not much. It is even less for heavier ions, as you can easily see from this graph. Let me come to the lateral scattering. Again, we have the electronic stopping. And if we go deeper into the theory of the electronic stopping, we will see that the electronic stopping is per, uh, performed via transversal momentum transfer. That means we have a lateral deflection from the original trans tra trajectory as a stochastic process. And these are now, again, practical values we calculated. You see, uh, at a range of 20 centimeters, the protons have a lateral straggling of nearly one centimeter. This is a lot. And it is much better, the beam is much sharper for carbon ions. This I have uh, got from Katya Parodi. She calculated that. This is a carbon ion beam. You see the lateral striking is pretty low, and this is a proton beam. And here the lateral striking is pretty large. And by the way, a photon beam is much sharper in the depth of the target than a proton beam. And this has some practical consequences. It is absolutely necessary to have a small air gap between the last beam forming element and the surface of the patient, as it is shown here. The gap should be as small as possible, at least small, smaller than 10 centimeters. And for doing the symmetry, one has to use 
the Black Peak Chamber detectors. This is an ionization chamber of eight centimeters diameter in order to take into account all that protons scattered in the depths of the target. Otherwise, you would not measure a correct depth dose distribution of protons. Nowadays, the, the manufacturers uh, increased this diameter again and came up now with uh, 12 centimeter diameter chambers. Let us come to the nuclear interactions. The general process which is going on when uh, projectiles hit a target is shown here. It is the abrasion, ablation model of uh, heavy ion uh, reactions. The projectile and the target usually perform a peripheral collision. In the overlapping zone, there is created a hot, dense, a nuclear material, the fireball, and uh, it remain it uh, remain the target fragment and the projectile fragment. This is the operation uh, uh, step. And now the fireball is exploding in nucleons and clusters. And furthermore, this deformed uh, target and projectile fragments are evaporating nucleons and later on gamma rays. And clearly, because these uh, uh, fragments lose nucleons, they may be radioactive. We have in, in uh, at the end, we have target fragments, projectile fragments, we have light uh, uh, particles and we have gamma rays and we can have radioactive nuclei and these uh, uh, products of these nuclear interactions can be used for range measurements for instance these radioactive nuclides can be used for particle therapy positron emission tomography these prom gamma rays can be used for prom gamma ray imaging techniques for instance, in Dresden, we have a device for measuring the range using these prompt gamma rays. And uh, some uh, researchers are using also these nucleons and clusters for measuring the range of the incoming particles. Yeah, let us look to the dosimetric consequences of these nuclear interactions. I have said the kinematics of nuclear fragment, fragmentation uh, uh, is mainly governed by peripheral collisions. This has to do with uh, 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 cross sections that is higher for peripheral collisions than for, uh, for central collisions. That means the uh, momentum transfer is nearly zero. That means the velocity of the projectile fragment is nearly the velocity of the projectile and the velocity of the target fragment after the collision is nearly the velocity of the target nucleus before meaning zero. Let us do an example. We have a carbon-12 beam and this carbon-12 beam is changed into a, a carbon-11 beam and the velocity of 11 carbon should be the velocity of carbon 12. And this is a scaling law for uh, different ion, for the range of different ions uh, with the same velocity. And then we see that the carbon 11 has a maximum range that is 0.92 of the range of the carbon 12, meaning the dose is transferred from the break peak into shorter ranges. Let us look to a second example. The carbon-12 beam may be converted into a 11 boron, and then we can do the same range calculation and end up with an overrange. That means also intensity from the Bragg peak is transferred out of the Bragg peak to higher range. 
And analyzing this in detail, we will see that we have a loss of primary ions. For carbon-12, the following numbers has been measured. For 200 MeV per nucleon, 30% of the carbon-12 are lost. And for 400 MeV per nucleon, 70% of the initially uh, initial carbon ions are lost. That means we have a reduction of the peak to plateau ratio. This is easily seen here in this, uh, uh, in this graph. We have a broadening of the Bragg peak and we have this so-called fragment tail of projectile fragments traveling a longer, having a longer range than the carbon beams. This fragment tail cannot be, uh, is not uh, uh, present for protons, but for heavier ions we have this fragment tail and this has to be taken into account in treatment planning. Uh, in the case of protons, you have here a graph uh, originally from Harald Pacanetti from Boston. Uh, this is not so uh, uh, important, but it has also to be taken into the treatment planning uh, uh, for protons, but it is not so important as for heavier ions. Yeah. Um, because of these nuclear interactions, we have an activation of all the components of the uh, particle therapy facilities which come into contact with the beams. I come back to my example of these brass collimators, and we have analyzed the activation of these brass components. And you see here, there is a mixture of a lot of radionuclides, which, are, which have lower mass than the constituents of these brass collimators. And you see also here, they have different half-lives. But the good news is, if you wait half a year, then you can... Uh, give this uh, uh, brass collimators free and you can sell it uh, on, on the market again. Yeah, but this has to be taken into account if you are running a, a, a particle therapy facility. This activation is an important issue in radiation protection. So, I am at the end of my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Enkart, for this introduction to the processes which are occurring when we are uh, interacting with the hadron, hadron, hadron uh, therapy within hadron therapy. So what are the important processes which are there? And I, there is no question yet. So my suggestion is uh, uh, please put back my presentation on, uh, on the, yeah. So I go back with my presentation. So uh, we have had this very first part of our talk where we have seen which are the basic physics for particle therapy when we are speaking about the hadron therapy. And uh, now let's go. So we will go back to Professor Engard at the end of the second presentation. Let's now go to uh, um, Professor Dr. Barbara Vischioni. So now we have a person who is really working in this type of uh, treatment. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Barbara Vischioni. You are muted, so okay. And uh, who is a doctor who's working since 2009 at the National Center for Oncological Hadron Therapy, now in Pavia. And it's leading activities of the ion beam qualification and radiation oncology. 
And the part that uh, uh, Dr. Viscioni will uh, deal with, it's how actually we go from the particles to the patients. So what are the main uh, processes which are involved? And uh, Professor Viscioni will focus, as it is seen here, on how actually the therapy is working and what are also the future plans, at least at the now clinical and fundamental research in terms of projects. So thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. And uh, we are very happy to, to host you in these uh, lectures. So please, the floor is yours and uh, bring us in the world of how this hadron therapy is really working in one of the um, centers where this is applied in Italy at Pavia at now. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, Hello? yes, we, we hear you and we see also the presentation. Perfect. Thank you again for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here. I am a medical doctor and uh, as uh, Catalina said, therefore, let's say the topic of my presentation will be more from the medical uh, point of view um, i will discuss of course uh, about uh, the application of uh, uh, particle research to medicine uh, let's start uh, with uh, radiation oncology just a brief introduction radiation oncology is a treatment uh, cure for uh, cancer uh, in recent years, it has undergone a rapid uh, technological evolution from a bidimensional therapy to 3D radiation therapy through to uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy and volumetric radiotherapy up to uh, proton and carbon ion therapy, which are in general called hadron therapy or particle therapy. Let's say that my institute uh, here, we sit together with uh, different uh, um, people from different speciality, as you see here, and it is where knowledge from different uh, uh, fields comes together in order to cure patients. Just to simplify, here I put, I put an image from uh, on the bottom of the slide from one patient with the tumor at the ear. You see, after treatment with radiation, the tumor disappeared. Basically, this is the aim of radiation oncology, which is to cure cancer, to give, a, let's say, cancer to, uh, to control tumor and give a response for the patient. So radiation oncology works uh, through the position of energy to uh, cancer cells in order to cure cancer cells. And of course, this can be done with uh, X-ray, photons and directions, uh, electrons in case of uh, conventional radiotherapy, but of course, in the case of hadron therapy, uh, same effect of cell killing might be uh, produced by uh, heavy ions, so protons and uh, carbon ions, which are the heavy ions mainly used in hadron uh, therapy. Of course, the uh, mechanism is different since uh, um, conventional radiotherapy works mainly through uh, radical production which damage uh, cancer cells, whereas hadron uh, therapy works mainly through direct damage to the uh, DNA doublelinks. Um, just briefly, uh, radiation therapy is basically a, a localized treatment, so let's say it can be compared to surgery. Uh, on the other side, there is of course, of course a chemotherapy and a systemic treatment that can be done to the patient through all the body. Uh, of course, uh, hadron therapy, because of the cost, because of the paucity of the facility, uh, cannot be given to all the patients. Usually, it's given to patients that cannot undergo surgery. 
or um, patients uh, that have tumor in a different location, such as uh, in the head uh, and neck. Usually, also, adrenal therapy is not uh, given to uh, metastatic patients uh, because, in these cases, uh, systemic therapy is preferred, uh, and also um, it is reported that uh, conventional radiation therapy, so radiation therapy with photos which is uh, the uh, most diffused in hospitals around the world, can be given to this type of patients. But uh, the, not to give you the wrong message, the, uh, to cure patients, uh, um, that needs to be done in a uh, heavy, um, heavy uh, in hospitals with a lot of knowledge, um, where um, the medical doctors from different specialties come together. So also here, where I work, we sit together with surgeons, with the medical uh, doctors, with the medical oncologists, uh, oncologists, um, conventional radiation oncologists, in order to find the uh, better cure for each single patient. Of course. The uh, physical properties of uh, particle therapy that uh, uh, it was uh, shown so clearly in uh, so well in the presentation before translate into a dosimetric advantage when we uh, um, when we prepare a treatment plan for for patients. Here you see in, in the line on the left side in comparison treatment plans on CT slides from, um, from a photon treatment plan on the left side and then a proton and carbon ion. You see that with photon we have a blue color all over the CT image. That means that photons deliver a lot of those bats or a lot of unwanted dose to normal structures, whereas since the blue color reduces slowly when we go to proton and carbon ion treatment plants, this means that uh, with the, the physical dose of particles, we are able to better conform the dose to the target and spare healthy tissues. So, uh, the physical selectivity of particle radiotherapy over X ray. Uh, make it possible in theory to increase the dose to the tumor target by sparing the dose to the normal tissue and actually by keeping the same dose to normal tissue as uh, X ray, for example. In that way, we can dose escalate the dose to the target and then uh, increase the tumor probability. This is true for both protons and carbon ions, but uh, in addition to that, for carbon ions, we have also um, favorable radiobiological radio properties for which carbon ions are more effective uh, compared to protons and compared to photons to cancer cells, approximately three times more. Therefore, carbon ions can be preferred to be used to, um, more, against more radioresistant tumors. Of course, uh, not only uh, advantages for particles, also uh, drawbacks of particle radiotherapy are, uh, are there. Uh, the drawbacks are linked to the uncertainties and complexities of uh, this type of treatment, as uh, uh, was shown in the presentation before. Intrinsic uncertainties are linked uh, uh, to the particle range and to the uncertainties related to um, anatomical changes in body shape uh, each day uh, that matters uh, in while we position the patient every day. And furthermore, uh, this is true more for uh, um, carbon ions, the uncertainty is uh, linked to the relative biological effectiveness of particles, uh, render the treatment uh, uh, again, uh, um, a bit uh, more, a bit uh, uh, complex uh, and uh, difficult to deliver, uh, since the variation along the path of the charge particle beam, the pattern of those distribution in different treatment plants, and uh, the uh, uncertainties related to RBE 
uh, with plants with different total dose and uh, deliver with different dose per fraction. So, uh, at this point, the level of evidence for particle is uh, poor, and actually, uh, we have the consolidated indications only for selected uh, tumors. Uh, in late years, the interest for adult therapy is increasing all over the world, and uh, uh, it is foreseen for 2023 uh, that approximately 150 centers will be, will be in operation around the world. In Europe, uh, there are 24 adult therapy centers uh, in operation at the moment, four of which are working with carbonarians. Uh, and one of these is, of course, now the center where uh, I work, um, the National Center on Oncological Adult Therapy in Pavia. The other, there are other two uh, more centers uh, in Italy uh, working with particles. One is in Trenzo, working with uh, Proton, and the other one is uh, in uh, Sicily uh, and is devoted uh, uh, only to uh, eye treatment with Proton. Uh, at now, um, we have uh, a dual beam, we have both uh, protons and carbon ion, which are accelerated within our 25 meters in diameter uh, synchrotron. The beams after acceleration are, the, are um, delivered in the three treatment rooms with uh, vertical and horizontal beams. The uh, beams uh, are delivered with the spot scanning technique, and uh, furthermore, we have uh, one beam devoted to uh, biological and physical research, one experimental beam and one uh, experimental room uh, is also in preparation. So briefly, uh, the milestones uh, of uh, our center, we started activity uh, in 2009 with uh, uh, two years uh, of experiment uh, for, to qualificate the beam qualify the beam for treatment. Then in 2011, we had the first patient treated with proton beams, and in 2012, the first one with carbon ion. Since 2016, we then performed a clinical phase of uh, uh, treatment of patients within a feasibility trial, um, where we had to produce data of uh, safety of uh, proton and carbon ion beam to present to the Ministry of Health. In, um, in um, 2016, we had the AC marking, European Commission marking on the synchrotron in our center, and finally in 2017, adron therapy was included in the essential levels of care of the Italian national health system here in Italy. This means uh, that since 2017, uh, treatment uh, with particles in our centers are reimbursed from the Italian national health system, especially for uh, um, uh, selected uh, tumor types and indication that you can find listed here in the slide. Of course, these are not many indication, we need to work on that to produce evidence of safety of the beams. The list includes uh, a typical indication for, for proton therapy, such as uh, um, pediatric tumors, uh, such as meningioma, such as uh, brain tumors, but also indication for uh, carbon ion radiotherapy, such as uh, uh, radio resistant tumors, uh, salivary and tumors, and sarcomas. Uh, in this last, so far, we have uh, treated now three, um, 3,600 patients. And uh, you see in the pie chart the relative incidence of the different uh, treatment we perform here at our center. Uh, you see the major indication of the facilities around uh, the world, the treatment facilities around the world, and also uh, uh, selected uh, indication uh, approved by the Italian NHS. Three fourths of the treatments here at our center are made with uh, carbon ion. This is because our center is mainly devoted to uh, research on heavy uh, ions. But in summary, here at our center, we treat 
with proton and carbon ions because of uh, the uh, peculiar uh, physical properties of particles to shape the dose to the target tumor in different location close to uh, delicate organs such as um, tumors within the head. We treat tumors of irregular shape and we perform also ray radiations. We reserve carbon ions especially for radio resistant tumors. Basically, this is what we do here at our center. In general, we could say that we could treat with particles all the tumors, but actually, since the uh, paucity of facilities and the cost and complexity of the treatment modality, at the end, um, we have uh, treatment only for selected indications. Some of so, some them I will present you now in the second part of my. Uh, talk today. So let's start with the salivary gland tumors. These are the rare radio resistant tumors. They are rare, so they are less than 1% of all known tumors, 2% of the tumors in the head and neck region. Usually, if uh, uh, at the initial stages they are good, with good prognosis, uh, easy to manage with surgery. But most of the time, they are discovered when they are uh, advanced and they go through the nerves in the uh, cranial region. So at this point, they are difficult to be treated with surgery. The uh, rationale for the use of particle therapy in the case of proton is uh, to try to spare the uh, buccal mucosa, then to avoid uh, damage to swallowing function and avoid uh, brain structures that avoiding uh, um, uh, brain damage. In case of carbon ion, the, the, the rational comes from the high radio resistance of this uh, tumor type. One of the histotypes of the salivary gland tumor is the adenocystic carcinoma, which is a, a typical indication for particle therapy that is treated uh, in all facilities uh, of particle therapy around the world. Here at now we have an experience of uh, 237 patients. Our uh, treatment, uh, our approach to this type of tumor is to treat uh, um, the, this type of tumor both with protons or with carbon ion, depending on the presentation of the tumors. If the patient has been uh, operated and we need to uh, sterilize the surgical bed after surgery, so we need less dose, then we use uh, protons, which better scatter the dose to the tumor target. If uh, the uh, patient is not uh, operable and uh, there is a huge tumor mass at the pretreatment uh, magnetic resonance, uh, we usually perform carbon ion because we want to exploit the high and the biological efficacy of, uh, of the beam. Therefore, we use carbon ion. On, in the slide, here in the, you see the survival course, uh, actually the local control course uh, of our treatments here at now. Uh, the outcome of the, our patients uh, with the carbon ion is quite good since um, uh, we had uh, tumor control after three years in 75% of the patients and after uh, five years in 53% of the patients. Here in the slide, in the bottom, I also uh, I have taken one image from uh, one paper published by the Japanese uh, at the National Institute for Radiological Sciences. Um, and uh, you can see that our results are in line with, the, uh, with what they have published with the carbon ion for, uh, again, adenocystic carcinoma. This is important because I did not say it before, but uh, at our center, we um, have adopted uh, protocols and uh, treatment schedules such as the one adopted in Japan, where um, in uh, lately, last century, treatment with carbon ion for a resistant tumor started. Uh, to go on, another indication, another classical indication for particle therapy is uh, skull-based chordoma and condosarcoma. 
these are uh, tumors that usually uh, arise from the spinal cord, all over the spinal cord, but they are mainly located uh, in the middle of, uh, the, of the head, close to the brain. So if the, they uh, are usually managed by surgery, but sometimes the surgery cannot be effective because uh, these tumors tend to, uh, to go close to optical nerve, optic structures and uh, brain stem. So the uh, surgeon, surgeon has very, uh, find it very difficult to remove all the tumor. And so at this point is where radiation therapy comes to try to solve the problem uh, that uh, the tumor uh, gives. But with conventional radiotherapy, the results are not good because this is again a very radio resistant tumor and it's also rare, but rare and rarity, rare and, rarity and, um, and uh, radio resistance most of the time goes together. But this is a very radio resistant tumor, so those, uh, the support so therapy is not enough to control this tumor. Right? This is why. Uh, Cordomus and Condosas comas of the skull base are classical indications for particle therapy. Again, uh, yeah, that now uh, we use the uh, um, same approach as I've shown you for uh, salivary gland tumors. So we use it for Cordomus and Condosas comas uh, either uh, protons or carbon ions. We use the protons in case that the tumor has been uh, removed by the surgeon and we need only to, to irradiate the surgical bed to prevent the relapse, whereas we use a carbon, carbon ion where the surgeon has not been able to remove the tumor or in inoperable cases in order to exploit the higher biological effectiveness of carbon ion. Here in the slide you see in red highlighted the result of uh, the now uh, of the now approach to uh, patients with chordomas uh, of the skull base, uh, either treated with protons and uh, with uh, uh, carbon ion. But you see that the results uh, at now are very similar to the results uh, in Japan, pointed out by the arrow here, and are a bit better to the results uh, obtained with proton in uh, uh, Switzerland and the PSI. Another indication for uh, particle radiotherapy and uh, namely for carbon ion due to the high radio resistance of these tumor types again is uh, uh, malignant mucosa melanoma of uh, um, the, the neck. Uh, this is a very invasive tumor. This is again rare. Besides radio resistance, it's 1% uh, of um, cancer in the, the neck region. And actually, it has the worst prognosis in the neck region. If, if it cannot be operated, that, then the, uh, the prognosis is very poor because the only option is then uh, conventional radiotherapy, which can, or that cannot control the tumor. This is why, um, uh, also since the beginning, uh, carbon ion radiotherapy has been. Uh, uh, proposed for these tumor types, uh, and we also do that uh, here at our center. So far, we have treated 40 patients, and uh, the result of control of the tumor after three years in our patient series uh, is above 88%. So, this is quite a good result. Uh, this is, let's say, this is in line with uh, the treatment performed in other carbon ion therapy facilities. And uh, what is interesting uh, in our series is also that uh, combination of uh, carbon ion plus uh, immunotherapy increases the prognosis of the patients, um, actually the overall survival of the patients are treated with, uh, with carbon ion. This is an interesting data also combined with the experimental data of the uh, the ability of carbon to boost uh, the uh, immunologic response uh, in uh, cancer patients. Not only uh, treatment of mucosal melanoma, but also uh, treatment of uvular melanoma, uh, sorry, of the melanoma at the eyeball, 
is performed with the fast food therapy, mainly uh, now we perform it with the uh, proton. We do it in four fractions um, with the uh, with the eye tracking, uh, with the light fixation by the patient. Before the treatment, each patient undergo uh, surgical placement of uh, the tandem clips in order to better sell, um, to, uh, to better have an idea of the tumor burden once uh, we have to prepare the treatment plan. Again, uh, here, uh, results of local control, tumor control are very good, about 95%. And in this way, patients uh, are able to preserve the orbit, and uh, half of them, half of the treated patients, of the treated patients, might be serving a visual function. Of course, not only treatment in the head, but also we, we as I said before, we treated also other locations in the body. Uh, an indication again is um, coronal coronal sarcoma localized along the spine but also in the sacrum. Concerning the sacrum location, now participate in this uh, uh, randomized trial comparing surgery with the carbon ion treatment. So we want to show that uh, carbon ion is a good alternative to surgery for this patient with the coronal and the sacrum which has a, a very big problem to patients affected by this uh, disease. Um, also, carbon ion um, is, uh, of course, uh, uh, performed in patients with uh, sarcomas. And uh, here uh, I, I have reported the experience of our center in a small series of patients with axial and pelvic bone and soft tissue sarcomas, all treated with uh, carbon ion radiotherapy, since, uh, since this is a very resistant tumor. Again, you see reported the results of local control and uh, overall survival, which are after three years of nearly uh, 70%, which is quite a good local control for these radio resistant tumors. While uh, these are mainly inoperable tumors, and if they are treated with the photon radiotherapy, then the uh, prognosis for these patients is very poor. As I mentioned before, also radiation, so recurrent tumors after first radiotherapy course, is one of the indications for particle therapy. Here, um, among all the uh, treatment sites, we have it now as rate irradiation, so again, irradiation after a first radiotherapy course, either with proton or carbon ion. I reported our experience published uh, two years ago about saliva, ray irradiation of salivary gland tumors in the head and neck region. Um, this, uh, in this case, I might say that the major issue is uh, toxicity for these patients because, of course, uh, we perform a new radiotherapy course uh, in a previously irradiated area, so therefore um, normal tissue has been already damaged by first course of radiation. In our experience, we treat here, um, we treated here salivary gland uh, tumors with the second course of carbon ions, as, uh, and as you can see, control of, um, of the tumors was very good after two years, and also our data about toxicity in blue in the table compared to the toxicity in other reported for other centers in China, Japan, and Germany um, were very good. So we did not encounter any uh, G3, uh, sorry, any G4, G5 toxicity. Just an example here on, uh, of uh, one of our retreated patients with the uh, retreated, so the second time with the second course of radiotherapy with carbon ion for an um, adenocystic carcinoma at the orbit. So the patient uh, after one year had the tumor control and in this way avoided two uh, to, to have the eyeball removed, the orbit removed by the surgeon. So in this case, uh, radio, uh, particle radiotherapy was a strategy, a strategy to preserve uh, 
the, uh, uh, the, the preserving, preserving uh, the organ. So, as I said before, uh, mission of our center is not only treating patients, but also uh, producing evidence for uh, new indications. These are just uh, some of the uh, clinical trials we have been going here at our center for uh, pancreas, pancreatic tumor, for gynecological tumor, for prostate cancer, and also one phase three randomized trial with colleagues from France to compare photon, proton, and carbon ion treatment in order to, uh, as a, and with an endpoint, uh, a better local control of carbon ion compared to the other uh, treatment modality. Finally, not only research, but just uh, uh, want just to mention the expansion project we have here at now, where we plan uh, to double the hospital space, the hospital and uh, treatment facility space, by uh, having a proton therapy gantry with a proton therapy single room. A double room uh, boron neutron capture therapy, uh, one for research and the another one for um, treatment of patients, and then we have also ongoing a project for a uh, carbon ion gantry for uh, more complex treatment with uh, carbon ion as well. So, this was my last slide, so thank you for the attention, and uh, now I'm ready for the questions. Thank you very much. That was really, really very interesting. And um, yeah, it's it's the way in which physics work also for the, uh, our our health. I would also invite to join us the first speaker, Professor Engard. Okay. So uh, um, I'd like to, I, yeah, there is in the chat only a comment about the thanking for the clarity of the talks. And I don't see other questions I want to address to those who are listening. If they have questions, to put them in the chat. Meanwhile, remind, let me uh, remind and thank to the support of uh, Frascati team who is uh, helping in organizing these public lectures. And uh, thank you very much to the team, Susanna, uh, are you there? Susanna Bertelli and Deborah Bifaretti together with uh, Elisa Santarelli. So I want to thank them very, very much. Um, yeah, so um, I don't see questions. However, let me ask uh, myself a question, take advantage of this. So I ask, I ask the question, I don't know who wants to answer, whether uh, Professor Engard or Professor Viscioni. Uh, are there any other type of ions presently considered for future in this field beyond carbon ions? I heard something about this, but I'd like to have a comment from one of you. Now, as far as I know, the colleagues in Heidelberg are working on an oxygen beam and they have furthermore a, a helium beam because they say the heliums are the better protons, as I have shown in my in my transparency, because the lateral uh, striking is, is much less than in the case of protons. Uh, uh, as far as I know, they work on these two beams and, and work on the commissioning of the, these two beams meaning they have one beam that is heavier than uh, copper. Oh, that's very interesting. So research, it's ongoing. This uh, is a, you? Um, yes, this is also what I know. Uh, here we have a project for uh, developing uh, new ions uh, as well. I think as well oxygen and helium, so that we are still working on that. And also, I'd like to ask a question um, to, to both of you. What about the pediatric uh, application of these uh, treatment plans, which for children, uh, small children, this might be quite different, right? Uh, concerning, 
maybe Barbara should answer. Uh, as I have shown in my presentation also, we had approval for pediatric treatment. So we use to, we have pediatric patients here at our center and we treat them with, uh, with protons. Uh, we want to increase, uh, let's say, the indication for our treatment for protons uh, in the future with the new gantry with uh, protons, because at the moment we cannot perform uh, all the treatment we would like to, because we have only six beads. But uh, for sure, this is something that we will do uh, in the future. It's a bit complex uh, uh, treatment uh, because uh, we have uh, very young patients and then we need to um, anesthetize them uh, because uh, as we saw in the presentation, movement is very uh, is an issue for, uh, for particle therapy. So uh, these are very young uh, children. So its treatment is complex, but uh, we we are working on that. Uh, so, let, let me add another comment concerning the pediatric tumors. Uh, here in Dresden, we we have uh, we were pretty careful when building up the proton therapy room because we built up in the near neighborhood close to the door of the therapy room we have an anesthesia and a waking room so that there is no necessity to to make the anesthesia in the treatment room it can be done outside and the patient is moved into the treatment room and that uh, led to the uh, to the result that we have no prolongation of the treatment because of the anesthesia and you know we have only one treatment room here in the proton therapy and we treat about 30 patients per day and two of them are usually children mm -hmm. and uh, they come they come mostly from the from the eastern german region to to dresden and they are referred to dresden because of proton therapy and on the other hand, you know, in Germany, there is another proton therapy facility in, in Essen, the West German Proton Therapy Center. And there are the most patients, children. Oh. This is their focus uh, uh, on the treatment of children from, from whole Germany and also from the Benelux uh, uh, states. I see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I don't see any other question coming. So let me take this opportunity to thank you really very, very much for this interesting and fascinating presentations, which show how the physics is useful for, for society in a very peculiar sector, the one of the health and moreover in the health of uh, tumors, which uh, are cured the way that Barbara has shown very nicely in the presentation using methods which were presented by Wolfgang in the first talk. So if you want to add anything else, just please go ahead now. Otherwise, I thank you once again very, very much for being uh, with us today and uh, do your presentations during this uh, public uh, lecture within the series of Strong 2020 European project good so thank you very much thank you also to those who were uh, with us uh, watching us and uh, i give you uh, an appointment to our next lecture in uh, probably about one month just stay tuned and uh, we will uh, bring you with other argument in the fantastic world of the strong interaction and its application thank you Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, bye Catalina. Bye bye. bye, -bye.